I am from Stockholm, where we have an archipelago. And I think my interest started there when I was a kid, sailing around between these islands. And I remember asking my parents whether or not these islands were actually floating on something or if they were attached to the core mm -hmm. of the planet. And I'm adopted to my family, which was quite clear because my sisters were tall and blonde, which is something I can't brag about being. But this, these questions really made it clear to my parents that I was a bastard because they had no idea why anyone would ever wonder about these islands and whether they couldn't answer and they thought it was irrelevant to find the answer to. So, so, so on, during these summers in the Stockholm archipelago, it, it, it was clear that we had different interests. And I think I haven't actually been particularly interested in stones themselves, which some people are, but what they, <laughs> what they can actually tell us about the history of Earth and how everything is, is connected to, to each, each, each other, basically. It is an explosion of animal life in the time period we have decided to call the Cambrian where we know that small life, it's a very general way of describing all the microbes that have been around on Earth since basically the beginning. Uh, they, ha they have been around for a very long time, but big lives in terms of visible life, which animals of course are, they come around very late in Earth history. And when they come around, it ac it's actually a very dramatic event. So we go from from no evidence or very little evidence of visible life to suddenly visible life all over the planet in just a short period of time when we talk about geological time scales. So it's still 10 or 20 million years, but that's a very short time if you consider that Earth has been around for 4.6 billion years. So in a very short time period, all representatives from all kinds of animal groups come onto the scene uh, at, the, at the same time. When was it? This is about half, let's say half a billion years ago. If you're, but it's, we actually have a time point which is saying 543 million years because we define it through traces of animals. So some, a specific trace fossil that shows up on the planet uh, globally. Uh, to, at, at the same time, is defining the beginning of the Cambrian. So we say that the Cambrian, the Cambrian starts at 543 million years ago, but it's actually more of a progressive event a, little, a bit before that and also afterwards. So if you look into the details, it's not actually a, an explosion, but it's still a very dramatic event. So the name explosion is because it goes very fast relative to the very, very long time span before. Before that, yeah. And the explosion is also probably because it's a very dramatic word, so it sticks in our minds. And it, but, it is a, but it is a very dramatic event. And it, so it's been roughly 4,000 million years before that that, has, that, that, that the Earth has been around. And small invisible life has been around for maybe three and a half billion years before this explosion of large life. So it's a very long protracted time where we have unicellular life and nothing big is actually diversifying. And then suddenly it diversifies quickly. So if you would say that our field has two million dollar questions, the first one is why there's life at all so, so soon in Earth history, the microbial life, that happens really quickly, which Minik Rosing has shown for example, with evidence from Greenland. But then the other million dollar question is why it takes so long for large life to actually come onto the scene. And when it does, it, re it is also very dramatic. So th this, those two million dollar questions is very sort of alive in the field. And I think I chose to work with the with one why there is so suddenly large life because it's a little bit more recent in Earth history. We have more evidence to, to, actually, to actually use and dig for. But if you go back 
four billion years to start understanding why there was life at all so soon after Earth formed. We have very little rocks preserved and, in, and, and you have to be quite macho to, to make stories of that, that data that's around. But you can, because you can almost picture Earth history as a library. We have evidence, but it's the further back into the library you go, more of the books are actually gone. So there are long shelves which are just empty. And in the very back, it's both dark and dusty, and the, the, the books have become brick hard, and you have to crush them to be able to get some of the words out of it. So it's, it's trickier to work in the deep time, real deep time, than with the Cayman explosion. If you were to have like a very basic geology class, I, I would skip everything else than just say the sedimentary rocks are the ones that we can really learn from because that is uh, sediments that fall down onto the sea floor and they record both the chemistry that was in the ocean, which is also reflecting the chemistry on the planet, but also signs of life. So. I, with macrofossils like these ones, but it could also be small fossils and carbon that's reflecting life in itself. So we use colors and chemistry and, and visible fossils and sort of invisible fossils also in the previous mud floor of the sea. This is that's what you can see, for example, on on this one. So this is the gray, all the gray stuff around is old sea floor mud, which is saying something just by being this dark. So we know it's actually a lot of carbon left, which says, says something about maybe oxygen levels and so forth. But, but the fossils themselves have been beautifully, beautifully preserved in these particular rocks. But it's, a, yeah, it's actually quite lucky because these, as you can see, are worms and sort of soft fossils. Usually these aren't preserved. Usually if a worm dies today, it's it's disintegrated, it's just become nothing within hours or days. So it really has a low, low potential to be preserved. So you can imagine that these ones have, are remarkable in the sense that they are preserved at all. And for some reason, we have several deposits which have preserved all the soft animals from the Cambrian. But not since then, so we've been extremely lucky to have specific conditions in the Cambrian that preserved all of the animals and not just the ones with, with hard shells and bones. Because, and, and that is the majority of all animal life in the ocean still ha has, are only soft, like jellyfish and worms and, and, and all kinds of stuff, most of it. That's a, that's a big debate, I, it's a, and it's a balance between different um, teams, I would say. Sometimes a very high-pitched debate between these two teams. So, I so in a general, if I generalize, I would say that one team is saying this has to been, have been a result of changes in the environment. And the other team, which is much smaller, says this was a biological event, so something within biology changed, which allowed it to happen. But as I said, the, the other ones, the chemical team, is so far a lot more loud and, and a, few, a lot more people, I would say. So, and among them, the main idea is oxygen. So the idea is that it, there was a change in atmospheric oxygen at that time. So if I just keep to the big team, because there, there are other hypotheses, but the main hypothesis is actually that Earth history would have looked something like this, that we have Earth forming here, and we have uh, about four billion years of no visible life, and that probably meant the idea says that we have very, very low oxygen. And then suddenly we have an increase of animals on the planet, which must have meant we suddenly have high oxygen. Uh, which allow this to happen. And this is, this have been an idea since a couple of hundred years, I would say, but in, the pr in, in print, maybe since the 40s, 50s at least. And it's still the, the dominant hypothesis, probably. But the thing is, now we have good 
better and better tools all the time to actually investigate if this is the case. And I would say it's not really uh, looking promising because if we do know that we've had oxygen for a long time and quite high oxygen in sort of half time of Earth history and we start to find evidence of oxygen since then also being maybe not very high but definitely enough for simple animals. And around the Cayman explosion we, we still don't have convincing evidence that there was a shift at all in oxygen. So it seems to have been quite low and quite, quite even for a couple of hundred million years when this happened. So I would say the oxygen team has uh, quite a lot of problems. And I've been part of the oxygen team. When I, since I, when I started looking into this, I actually thought it would be pretty easy to find the right rocks to analyze before and after the explosion. And with the new chemical, geochemical tools we have, just see that there is a, a difference in oxygen, but we didn't. So we, we, we're part of this flat line, the results we've done that's actually saying there is no specific change in atmospheric oxygen around this time. We're, we are really dependent on oxygen. So I think that might have influenced the way we have asked questions because we know that we can't su survive more than a couple of minutes without oxygen. So we interpolated that to Earth history and this history of animal life that of course it has to have to do with oxygen. There is on the sort of the still smaller team, there are good arguments for maybe that there was one organism that suddenly realized how they could eat another one. And that in itself would, would start or trigger a diversification event because the ones that were eaten might have been able to, to build protective shells or something that made them different. And, and in that sense, it would be like an arms race. So predation is suggested to be one of the triggering factors. Uh, other ideas have to do with maybe the innovation of eyes. So if someone started to be able to see, even if there was a low diversity of organisms, the one who had the ability to see would be able to instigate a change in the ecological systems. And the two things together would be extra strong. Yes. But the, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, criticism to these biological explanations is that it, it might be an advantage, but it might and not the two things lead together to a change in diversity. It might change the sort of the body plans and the way to have a, it might trigger a bigger variety of how things look, but not necessarily this huge increase in diversity on all animal, in all animal groups. So, so that's been the biggest uh, criticism against the biology explanation, biological explanations. We can only use the clues that are given to us from the geological record, but there are, as I said, so many books missing, so there will be gaps that we don't understand and we will have to make our own sort of uh, bridges between these gaps. So, so the geological record is fantastic, it's also limited, but it's the only thing we have. So if you, uh, when I talk to my, um, my family then, my <laughs> where I, when my adoptive family, they have no idea what I mean with the geological record. They think I'm as interested in Viking ships that I was sort of, <laughs> and, and maybe ice cores and Greenland, but anything like that, you know, before internet and libraries and ice cores, it's, 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 it, reach very, it's very, it reaches very shallow into the history of, of Earth. So anything older than a couple of hundred thousand years, you, we must rely on the geological record. So that's, it's precious, but it's not perfect. The Cambrian Earth looked something like this, and we know we have a handful of these very special libraries from the Cambrian with all, with all the animals preserved. And one of them you probably have heard about, which is the Burgess Shale. 
and then we also have a, another one called the Chenjiang, but one is actually very Danish, called the Sirius Passet, which is one of the two oldest ones, which is about 518 million years. So it's very close after the Cayman explosion, where, where the whole ecosystem, more or less, has been preserved. And when we were on uh, to collect samples from Greenland, for example, it can look like this. And if, you're not, if, if you haven't been interested in geology before and you take one of these flights over Greenland where all the green stuff is gone, all the mosses and trees are just not there, you would definitely fall in love with geology or glaciers because it's absolutely gorgeous. And um, also to be in the field with, with good colleagues, uh, here are Sam Arne, for example, uh, for three weeks walking up and down the hill looking into these layers of, of pre previous seafloor that nobody's seen, nobody's opened them in 518 million years to actually sort of greet these fossils and say, hi, you're not going to be, you're not going to be just weathered away. We'll, we'll pick you up and bring you home. It's, uh, uh, it's, it just is evidence that uh, I think we have the best jobs possible. <laughs> So then I, I, and, and the others are mostly interested in the fossils, of course, but I take home samples to, to just crush them up and look at the geochemistry. So I, we bag them up, whether or not we, the samples we're interested in. And when I get back, I, I enjoy to create, to make powders of these precious <laughs> rocks and, and boil them in different ways. And the other one is from China, for example, where we know, where we've also been drilling, which creates an even better uh, window to this time because it hasn't been exposed to rain or, or sun or heat for since then. And the cores looks, look beautifully preserved. And, and they, if we find the fossils on the, on the surface, they're very weathered, as you can see, and yellow and all the chemistry is just sort of rained out. But if we drill it like this, we can actually use the chemistry also. So in combination with all these, that's what I, we do when, when I come home, I boil, boil the sediments and do some fancy melting and we extract all the chemistry we can. So together with the fossils and the chemistry and indications of how sea water, have, sea levels have changed and so forth, we can sort of get a, pic, a, better, a, a picture when it's all combined. So that's how we get to use the fossil record that's there. But as I said, it's a handful of these places that are this old and this, these sort of well-preserved and, and possible to work with. There was just news about a new one in China. Yes. It looks very fascinating. Very fascinating because uh, uh, these are known to be well, the animals, to, they're known to have animals that are exceptionally well-preserved. But this new one, which is also found in China, is absolutely breathtaking because, as I said, it's soft animals just sort of uh, melt away in the, in the ocean. And you can imagine a jellyfish and just the tentacles, how you would even make it possible. I don't know how you'd preserve it, but in, the, in this deposit you can actually see tentacles from jellyfish that have been preserved. I don't even know how I would do that in a lab to preserve a tentacle from a, from a jellyfish. But for some reason it happened. So now we have one more to, to look for clues of what environment they were actually living in. Yeah, I definitely think it's a new way of looking at it at least. And as I said, I was part of the oxygen team when I yeah. started this and when I thought it would be one answer <laughs> to this question and I realized <laughs> along the way this isn't this isn't adding adding up we have this evidence of no change in oxygen around the cave and, and we have this evidence of large life one and a half billion years too early what's actually going on and at some point I felt that the team of geochemists uh, were just fighting with each other about this, this absence or presence of evidence of oxygen. And uh, I, I thought, so I thought we, I better do something else. I was actually at a conference where I felt 
uh, kind of uh, excluded and, uh, and provoked by this, this fighting between teams. And then a microbiologist who was at the conference, she also said, now I know why you geologists are so aggressive, because you can't go back into the lab and actually redo the experiments. So you have to fight each other with, with the in interpretations. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized she was right, because there are only those deposits and those a certain number of, of deposits, sort of uh, formations we can go to to actually get data, and that's it. So then I thought, I have to go back into the lab. How do I do that? And I, and I started looking into tumors and cancer, because of course, tumors are unfortunately very successful at jumping from one cellular stage to multicellular stage, and they do it all the time, whether or not they have oxygen or not. So I thought, what is their trick? What are they actually doing to be this so-called successful? So I shifted, in a way, from geochemistry to, 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 to looking into what tissue actually is. And, uh, and I think I, it completely reversed my view on what it takes to become big. Before I thought it, it, it only needed some, some oxygen and maybe light and some carbon. And then as soon as you turn those three up, you're going to get large life. But I actually now think it's really, really difficult to become big. And I have three arguments to say why this is actually quite difficult. And one of them you've seen already that over time, Earth history, of course, large life is very late. Maybe that's actually because it was difficult for large to become lar uh, life to become large. And the other arg argument is when you look at uh, diversity within all life, it's definitely rare to be big. Even though we make such an impact on Earth today, Vertebrate or, or vertebrate animals are super few in comparison to other organisms. Like this is on the axis over there. It's a bit thicker and it's brown. Those that's us. That's all the vertebrates. So we are super few in comparison to invertebrate animals, the jellyfish and the worms and and the others. They're 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 significantly more of those. But the most of every all diversity on Earth are the, are the purple x-axis there is the microbes so if you want to be normal and feel normal you should be a microbe that we are super super rare uh, and special and, and and this is according to cell types we have about 200 cell types which is exclusive very 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 difficult and the and the third arg argument comes from the cancer field and and from us actually where i didn't know that we have as many cells in us as there are stars in the galaxy. But these cells are continuously changed. So we're actually like an organism in flux. We're not the same from day to day. We change our cells all the time. And we do that in one, and one simple, just one way. And that's through stem cells. And I thought, like many of my geology colleagues, that stem cells has nothing to do with me. That's just a fancy research field in Korea somewhere, and it doesn't concern me, but it really does just during this, this time when I have your attention, all of us are changing or renewing cells thanks to the stem cells. So that's the only way that we get new cells from these stem cells. And the thing is that stem cells don't like oxygen. So that's the paradox. And you can see I've just tried to show it there as this sort of quiet little uh, cell that resides somewhere where it's low oxygen and gives us all the new blood cells and all the new skin cells and everything that we change is thanks to the stem cells. So I, I, I picture it as a meditating quiet cell that resides in different places and when we need them they just duplicate themselves. It would be perfect if we can do that, just duplicate ourselves when we're needed, but that's what the stem cells do as long as they're protected in their environment. <clears throat> so it means that the, that the whole process of being us is a very oxygen sensitive process. So to make new tissue, which we do, we, as much as, as many stars that there, that there are in the galaxy, we change every year. So you can imagine how many cells 
we actually, how many times do we actually need these stems? We completely rely on them all the time. And in a lifetime, we've made a new intestine like five or 10,000 times, thanks to stem cells. So I, I, I now tend to sort of praise them for being there, but they, we just take them for granted and we think it's just us, but it's actually thanks to the stem cells that we can live for 100 years, if we're lucky. <laughs> So, and, and so this is actually, that's what I mean with us being really special. We're actually, or, or that we are this, sort of have this observation bias. We take it for granted. For us, it feels easy to be us. But maybe we're actually really a paradox. And, and a paradox I try to show you here that we have blood, which is super oxygenated, that runs next to stem cells. That shouldn't be possible, but it, clearly it works. We, make, we have these skin, skin stem cells next to blood, for example, but they don't like oxygen. Why are they there? That's sort of the, uh, a paradox and a secret that we manage that nobody's even realized is a secret or, or a paradox yet. So we just eat and sleep and we grow older and live, but it's actually quite specially designed, I would say. And, and, and that's where this comes in with this, with this key to, to hold stem cells as stem cells, even though it's oxygen around. And that's one of the tricks that cancer hijacks. It, it's called, it's, here I just call it HIF or HIF2, which is sort of a molecular key into the cellular machinery, so which it can make cells think it's low oxygen, even though it's not. So this is an extremely useful key for cancer stem cells because cancer is a stem cell disease. You can call it a stem cell disease. The cells start to behave as they are stem cells. And the way they do it is that they hijack this system with HIF2 for many of the tumor cells and tumor types, not all of them, but, but many of them do. So they, so they just sort of open that door and use that key to become a stem cell even though it's oxygen around which means that they can actually live and duplicate and make new cells in any environment where it's also high oxygen and i think this isn't really tested yet but i think this isn't something new that cancer cells just make up they don't invent anything new they do they use the same library that our cells have normally so i i'm suggesting that a key like this, like the HIF key, has also been really important for the diversification of animals to actually cope with oxygen conditions. Rather than, rather than that oxygen was low and then increased, I suggest it's been high enough for a long, long period of time, but we weren't able to get into it before we developed something like the HIF system. So I, I looked into at which, who, ha, who has these HIFs in the tree of life. Uh, and and this, was a, this is another way of showing it that you have cells that are immature like stem cells at low oxygen. But if you increase it to 3 or 21, they actually differentiate and lose their capacity to make new cells. You can do that with low oxygen or HIFs. And when I looked into the tree of life, I can see that only animals that diversified in the Cambrian have these HIF keys. So if you look into slime molds, for example, or fungi, they don't have these kinds of keys to fool cells that it's low oxygen when it isn't. And we have two types. I would say that invertebrates have a little bit less good key, but they is still a very useful one compared to having no HIFs at all. And us vertebrates has the biggest one, be best one. We have this HIF2 key, which can really fool cells to think they, are, they should be stem cells when it's, when it's high oxygen. And, and, and interestingly enough, it's first after animals developed this HIF, this bigger key to the stem cell machinery, that we also start to have proper blood systems with red blood cells, which can really soak the system with oxygen which makes sense that first you have to control your stem cells and fool, uh, put them in pockets where it's low oxygen or, or fool them with these keys to say it's low oxygen. And then you can start exposing them to high oxygen without making a difference. So what you're saying is that you have this 
environment with oxygen. Yeah. And if you want to make big life, you need to have stem cells. And if you cannot keep your stem cells as, as stem cells, you will not be able to have big life. Exactly. You would not be able to get into the oxic environment, which is the best environment if you want to have a high energy demand. So if you want to sort of invest in expensive organs, like our brain, for example, consumes a lot of energy, but you can't even get into the oxic environment before you have control of your stem cell system. You can still, you can probably still have multicellular life at very low, at these lower oxygen concentrations where you can still have some stem cells, but you will be restricted. You would not be able to cope with changes in atmosphere, in oxygen concentrations, which is, which is very rare. It's very rare with environments on earth where there are stable conditions. And you would also not be able to support an ecosystem that is very that isn't very broad. You know, you would be able to just have a very limited ecosystem, which probably doesn't create diversity enough to be even preserved in the fossil record, which actually fits what, what we see now. So, so I picture it as I mean, it fits with the with the observations. I would say that we do have oxygen since billions of years on Earth, probably enough for simple animals, but we don't see them actually diversify. But we do see evidence of some multicellular life. It's not diverse, and it's, but it is there. So I would, I'm thinking now it has to do with this limit of getting into the oxygen environment and really using it. It's almost, I see it almost like a gated community and the door is really locked, you know, but some when we developed a system like the HIF, we could actually open the door to this, this, this community and start building really big houses and investing in, in, in coffee machines and everything that costs energy, which is what our kidneys and brains and muscles are. So you actually see, uh, think that this invention of this HIF key or whatever you call it, opens the door that started the campaign explosion. Yes. So you think it's a molecular yes. kind of a biological system. A biological, yes. So I've shifted teams completely from the oxygen team to the biological team. And then it strikes me also that other big revolutions in life on Earth, we have no, we, we ascribe to biological innovations like the e event of sort of photosynthesis. We think that's a biological event and also eukaryotic cells, we think that was a biological event when cells started to collaborate and engulf each other and the sort of real increase of atmospheric oxygen we ascribe to, to trees, the, the effect of trees. So some of the really big revolutions in life on Earth we do explain with biological causes or we have biological explanations for them, but for, spe specifically for this Cambrian explosion, we have stuck to the environmental explanation for, I don't exactly know why, but I think it might have to do with us ourselves being so dependent on oxygen. But it's interesting because plants and, and fungi are also, have also managed to get, so to get many to get diverse, and they have similar keys working in a similar way than the HIFs. It's not exactly the same. So I would, I would s speculate that three, three groups of, of organisms managed to evolve ways to come around the problem, with oxy that, the problem that oxygen has on, on stem cells and, and cell, cell fates, it's called cell fates. So, so I, but, but it has some, some, um, some huge implications because it, it, the, the, the way I describe, understand these keys is that, or basically what I'm saying is either the HIF key is allowing us to fool the stem cells or we definitely need low oxygen conditions still. So I'm actually suggesting, so, so one of the implications of the idea is that invertebrates, so basically insects and worms and most of all big life on Earth still needs hypoxic conditions, so low oxygen conditions. And that's a big claim because 97% of all animals on the planet are invertebrate animals. And I'm saying they're not very good at being 
in oxic conditions. So, but but then when you, when and so first I thought it was a poor hypothesis, but when I start to look into the literature around different invertebrate animals, they might they might still have one foot in the in the low oxygen environment. And this is an example of an ant's nest, for example, which is underground, and we haven't measured what oxygen is in an ant's nest but I can bet you that it's low oxygen in the ants nests and I don't think it's a coincidence I think they manage their environment to uh, to uh, to have access to low oxygen in the truly low oxygen so they manage their stem cells with truly low oxygen conditions more than we do we're sort of more detached than they are to to their sort of ancestral environment for all of us, which is low oxygen conditions. Mm -hmm.